this is Gail with Experiences You Should Have, your how-to guide for amazing experiences. And today, we're going to be talking about Via Freda climbing the Dolomites in Italy. And I mean, this is an incredible experience. And I am here with Shannon McDowell, who is a two-time world champion in Ultimate Frisbee. But This isn't about Ultimate Frisbee, but I've got to say, Shannon is one of the most interesting people that I have ever met, and we're going to learn today how to make this incredible Via Ferretta climbing experience a reality. Nice. Hi, Shannon. How are you? Hi, Gail. Doing great. Thanks so much for having me on. Ah, this is going to be a fun one. I have never heard of Via Ferretta until I talk to you. Uh, Can you explain what Via Ferretta climbing is? Sure thing. Um, So Via Ferretta climbing is a lot like rock climbing, but there's a couple differences. And one of those differences is that when you climb Via Ferretta, there's a fixed line which means that there's a line going up the rock that you clip into instead of bringing your own rope. Whoa. Okay, so so you have different things inside the rock that you can clip into or or do you need to to bring do you need to bring those with you? Like how does that work? Totally. So there's a device that you bring with you called the Via Ferretta device and you it's basically like a rock climbing harness that any kind of rock climber would wear, but it has an attachment that you um, use to clip into the rope that is on the Via Ferretta. Wow. Now, I've never heard of Via Ferretta, and I live here in Oregon. Uh, Where do people do this Via Ferretta? Via Ferretta climbing is a really traditional form of climbing in Europe. The basis of a Via Ferretta is that it's along a rock climb route, but there's additional features that have been added by man uh, to Mm. make the rock climbing a little bit easier. So you'll often find metal ladders or bridges attached to the rock itself that make it easier. Um, And this type of climbing is very traditional in Europe, but isn't very popular in the United States. Do you know why that is and why it's not popular here? Um... The climbing traditions of the United States really fall along the leave no trace line. Um, So Mm -hmm. in the U.S., we have a lot of rock climbs that the goal is really to leave the rock the way it was. But that tradition doesn't necessarily exist in Europe. So they have these climbs that have been altered by humans uh, more often than what you'd see in the United States. Got it. So uh, is it ruining nature in a way? or Is there harm being done to the rock by... By adding these ladders and, and metal clasps to the to the rock? I would say that there's no, the rock isn't necessarily being harmed, but it may make the aesthetic of the rock a little bit different than what we typically see in the United States because you would be able to see the feature itself. Um, but that's a little bit more well um, altering Altering nature um, is a little bit more well established in Europe, in European culture. Got it. Got it. So so where did you do this Via Ferretta climbing? And and tell me a little bit more about your experience. Yeah. So in the 2014, I was fortunate enough to uh, compete in Ultimate Frisbee World Championships in Lecco, Italy. (laughs) Yeah. And so uh, we were in Lecco, which is in the lakes region of northern Italy near Lake Como. And uh, one of my teammates and I love to rock climb. And we knew about the climbing in the Dolomites and researched how we could go do that ourselves and learned more about Via Freda through that process. Wow. Wow. Oh, that, that's incredible. Uh, so, so how long were you there? How long were you... Were you doing like Via Ferretta climbing? Yeah. So after the tournament, we spent about a week in the northern Dolomite region of Italy, uh, tr- you know, looking around, climbing Via Ferretta, and then we came home after that. How 
So while you were there, like where where did you sleep? Where did you stay? Like how how did this work? Yeah, so we visited a couple different areas of the northern Dolomites. Mm-hmm. Um, in Italy, there's two Dolomite regions of the same mountain range. So there's the lower Dolomites, which mm-hmm. are a little bit more rolling hills. Um, you get a little bit more farmland in that area. And then there's the upper Dolomites, which are very mountainous uh, on the border with Switz- Switzerland. So can you just go and climb the Dolomites and, and do like Via Freda climbing in a day or... Or could you spend a couple months up there doing it? Or how does that work out? You definitely need at least a day in the northern Dolomites to be able to climb a Via Freda. It's about a day worth of trip from a highway to wherever you'd like to go and then back. Got it. Um, but in terms of how much time you could spend there, you could spend quite a bit of time in the Dolomites exploring that area. It's absolutely beautiful with uh, feature, rock features that um, would be as breathtaking as national parks in the United States. Wow. Wow. So I guess if, if you want to go climbing in the Dolomites, uh, where might you stay? Where, where would you need to go? Yeah, so you have a couple options of where to stay while you're in the Dolomites. One of those options is the Refugio. And Refu- refugio. 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 Okay. Yeah, so, um, and a refugio is basically a cabin that is being managed by uh, an Italian. And in these cabins, they can be either right along the highway or even in the wilderness area. And they are basically like bed and breakfasts managed by somebody. And you can rent a bed in these refugios. And potentially buy a breakfast or dinner while you're there and, you know, use that as a home base to climb out of. Wow. Okay. I've, I've never even heard of these refug- refugios. Maybe it's mm-hmm. kind of, is it similar to like Airbnb in a way or? Uh, you can definitely do uh, Airbnb style uh, refugios. There's, al- there's also, um, in addition to a typical Airbnb style refugio, there's also... They're more like a low-key hotel or bed and breakfast, I would say. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, many bed and breakfast breakfasts I've been to, they're they're not exactly kid friendly. Could you bring a kid to a refugio? Refugio? You there's definitely different options, and I'd recommend researching before you go. Uh, some refugios have uh, private rooms that you can rent. Oh. Others have. Um, bunk bed style situations that might be a little less kid friendly um, since there would be potentially other guests in the same room. So kind of like a hostel in a way where you can rent a room or have like bunk bed rooms. Yeah, I would. Yeah, it's like a hostel, but a little bit more adult friendly. Oh, okay. (laughs) All right. There's also the option to camp. So where where would you camp up there if you wanted to camp and, and do these? Yeah. Uh, so Italy has, in, especially in northern Italy, there's a really interesting culture of roadway camping. Um, on, roadway camping. Yeah. So a lot of the highways and sort of roadways in northern Italy have pullouts that people will camp in at night um, for free. Oh, for free. Wow. That's right. So pullouts that people will camp in, do you mean like like a pullout on the road or, or there's... Yeah, it's basically a pullout in the road. And so you bring your own tent and sleeping bags and... Yeah, you see people with tents and sleeping bags. Um, There are some people camping in trailers and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you're not used to uh, driving a trailer on a small windy road, I wouldn't recommend bringing a trailer. (laughs) So so I want to go to Italy. I want to go climbing, Via Freda climbing, and and maybe I want to make it as cheap as possible and, and camp. Um, do you recommend just bringing like a tent and sleeping bag with you from, from where you're traveling from? Or is there like, can you rent this type of gear or how, how would you go about doing that? If I was going to do that, I definitely bring my own tent and sleeping bag. I think, um, you just, it would just be one less thing you have to think about when you get to Italy. Right. Uh, there's a lot of differences in the culture between the United States and Italy. So if you have that before you go, you'll be really well set up just to smoothly exit the city and head north to the Dolomites. Got it. Now, now with Via Ferrata climbing, I've got a three-year-old. 
uh, could she come via Freda climbing with us? Or would you say this is not a kid friendly? I wouldn't necessarily recommend via Freda climbing for a family with small children. Okay. Um, and that's because you're really, you really are clipped into um, a high exposure environment, um, potentially on a cliff. Um, and there's just an element of not being able to really fully control the situation of another human being. So you really want to make sure that uh, if you're doing this, that you either are with a guide who's professionally trained in making sure you're safe or you have experience with rock climbing in the United States. Got it. Got it. Now, uh, what if you have zero experience rock climbing and you're going to go with fellow adults? Uh, could you do this? There's different levels of uh, difficulty with Via Freda, Via Freda climbing, and there's definitely some that are a lot safer than others. So you might be able to find some of the easier routes to do if you don't have experience, but I would recommend learning as much as you can about Via Freda's safety before going out there and doing it on your own. Got it. Now... I would probably want a guide. I love having guides. They know way more than I do, and they, they know exactly where to take me. And and how would you find a, a Via Freda a guide, or do you have any recommendations? Yeah, um, we actually didn't use guides on our trip because oh. we did. Um, my, uh, my friend and I do have climbing experience, so we were able to do this without um, a guide. But there are guides in almost every town in that area. Yeah. Um, you would likely be able to find one through a local travel agency in uh, Italy. So maybe also just, can you just paint the picture of, of a day of Via Freda climbing? Sure thing. So um, typically Via Freda climbing, you wake up in the morning and hopefully the night before you've selected your route. Uh -huh. um, definitely pre-plan. So figuring out um, how long you expect it to take, um, what your plan is, if you know you don't like it, how are you going to descend if you need to go down? Mm -hmm. And um, so hopefully by the time you've decided to do a route, you've had all of this um, conversation with the person you're going to go with. And uh, you wake up and um, it's generally about, I would say, a 30 minute to couple of hours hike to the Via Freda route, depending on which one you're going to. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and so how long did your Via Freda route take? Yeah, so we did a few while we were there. And the ones that we did, we chose specifically because they would take about half a day. Mm -hmm. And the reason we did that was because um, when we were in Italy, it was mid-August and there were um, thunder showers in the second half of the day. Ah, got it. So we were making sure that we were going to be off route by the time that happened. So we were waking up quite early to get this, um, and making sure that you know what the weather is going to be doing that day is extremely important to making sure you have a safe journey. Got it. Got it. And, but if you wanted to, to spend a, a week up there doing Via Freda climbing, could you, could you camp and Via Freda climb? The Dolomites? Absolutely. In fact, I would highly recommend uh, the Dolomites National Park in northern Italy if you're interested in doing a multi-day journey. Mm -hmm. uh, you can um, camp and stay in refugios in the backcountry of that national park and do a lot of really cool stuff. Cool. So it's absolutely cool. gorgeous. <laughs> wow. Okay. So what was your favorite part about your Via Freda climbing trip? So I would say that the favorite, my favorite part was in addition to the camaraderie of being there with a friend and the amazing scenery um, was also the experience of the history of the area um, because Northern Italy was involved in World War I and there's mm -hmm. very interesting historical um, relics of the area in the Dolomites. Wow, cool. That it's, is so cool. Yeah, it's really interesting to be you know, in this beautiful natural place, but with such, you know, such history as well. We don't have that in the United States as much as they have in this area of Europe and probably other areas as well. I mean, this sounds, this sounds incredible. So when you're doing this via Florida climbing, are you, are you mostly doing uh, ladders, clipping in? Uh, I've even seen some pictures of people looking like they're on like tightrope type of things. Like, 
What is it mostly consisting of? Yeah, it's highly variable. It really depends on the climb itself. Mm -hmm. um, I would say the ones that we did while we were there consisted of um, some pretty classic rock climbing as well as ladder climbing and uh, using railings. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to some of the more... Um, difficult ones a lot of times that means a little bit more exposure so those would be the ones where you are uh, maybe doing a little bit of type rope rocking with a, an assist on the arm so some kind of railing as well as a small ladder uh, we didn't do anything like that though so was there any like interesting stories from your trip or i don't know something funny that happened so actually, it was really interesting. On our final day of climbing, uh, we climbed a route right outside of uh, Corvara, Italy. And we get up to the top, and there's a refugio right at the top of this route, which was absolutely amazing. We went inside, ordered some lunch, had some wine. Wait, so wait, it's at the top of this route. So how are they getting wine and food and... And the whole bit up there. Really good question, Gail. And um, actually, a lot of the refugios have basically a ski lift uh, cord that you can haul food to the top of these mountains with. Um, they're not made for humans, though. They're just for supplies. So I can't stow away and take the easy <laughs> way up? <laughs> Typically, no. You have to find your own way. Um, there's hikes as well as climbs. So you can choose your way to go sometimes, at least. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, maybe I just take like an airplane over and they can yeah. just like drop me off. <laughs> Helicopter. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, but so we're eating lunch and then we get outside and this is the 15th of August. Uh huh. And it's white out snow. Wait, what? White out snow? Yeah. How high are you? Uh, we're not that high. Um, a, you know, a few thousand feet, not yeah. too high. Um, but I guess this, you know, the August and later time of year, it can be highly variable in these mountainous regions. Wow. I had no idea. No idea. Mm -hmm. So, so what was that like? Were you prepared for this whiteout? What happened? Yeah, we were, we were prepared. Um, we had layers, um, mm -hmm. definitely packed layers in our bags for the day. Um, and we ended up, uh, deciding that we could hike out and just hiked downhill. And by the time we got back down it wasn't rain you know it wasn't snowing down in the lower elevations mm. wow oh that's, that's incredible so how, how was the the food and wine at the refugio delightful <laughs> <laughs> yeah i would say so nor northern italy is actually a lot more ethnically related to switzerland and germany than it is to the rest of italy uh -huh. but you can still find some really good wine there um however the the people there generally drink beer more than they drink wine what kind of beer? Uh, lagers generally huh. are the the thing that you'll find in those areas, especially the less touristy regions. Do you have any favorite lagers that you had up there? I can't say I'm a huge lager fan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that was something that we didn't necessarily see in our research that was a surprise and very interesting for us. And I, am, I always enjoy being surprised in that kind of a way. So, yeah. Yeah. So what's the food like in northern Italy? The food is, you'll find a, a lot of variation because it is part of Italy, but, you know, it is related to the, you know, Switzerland mm -hmm. and Germany. So right. you'll find everything from, uh, you know, risotto and pasta and pizza, red wine to, you know, your typical, uh, you know, sausages and, uh, you know, lagers of Switzerland and Germany. Got it. Got it. So... So I want to talk a little logistics here. Um, so if you want to go to the Dolomites and do Via Ferrata climbing, uh, how do you how do you get to the Dolomites? And and do you suggest a, a renting a car while you're there, or you know what? Great question. Uh, there's a couple different options in terms of flying into an airport nearby. It really depends on uh, what else you are interested in doing while in Europe. I would say. Um, mm -hmm. The options include Milan Airport, uh, Venice, mm -hmm. and then if you're interested in doing something in Switzerland while you're there, you're also pretty close to Munich and Zurich airports. 
So what I'd recommend is doing a little cost analysis of those places, um, including uh, the potential fee of crossing the border between Switzerland and Italy Mm -hmm. in your analysis and figuring out, you know, what works best for you in terms of airport. Got it. Is it expensive to cross the border? Um, When we were there, it was about 20 to 30 euro. Um, But I would imagine that would have changed in the, you know, last couple of years. I'm not sure what it is now. So uh, what were you using to get around? We rented a car, and that's what I'd recommend in this region of Italy. Uh, There are a few places that you can take the train from the cities into the northern regions, but you'd be pretty limited once you got there. Um, These regions are quite rural, and having a car is really um, a great way to get around. So did you just buy like a pass when you entered the national park, or uh, were there any like special passes you needed? Uh, for the national park, there was no fee where we were. Oh, okay. Um, but you would want to make sure that if you stayed overnight, that you were aware of any overnight fees um, and potential reserva- reservations at the refugios inside the park. Mm-hmm. Um, now, is there like one particular site to go to 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 book refugios? Is there like a refugio B and B type of? There's not a refugio B and B site. Um, what I'd recommend doing is um, that you can look on vrbo.com. That mm-hmm. one has a lot of options, and then there are a couple guidebooks that are available um, about climbing in the Dolomites. They're available on Amazon.com. I think if you just you know googled or looked yeah. on Amazon for uh, Via Freda climbing in the Dolomites, there's a lot of information about the refugios there. Cool. In addition to those books, you'll also definitely want to purchase maps once you get to the region that you're going to be in. Mm-hmm. Um, Italy has a lot of um, really well-made maps of their northern areas, um, mm-hmm. I think most of the country, but they're by region, and you'll really want to make sure that you're well-equipped with um, the map of the area that you're going to be climbing in. Got it. Now, as far as like renting a car and and getting around, are you driving on the right side of the road, the left side of the road? Yeah, you drive on the right side of the road in Italy, which is really nice. Um, Italian drivers are aggressive, like you've heard, (laughs) um, but it's very predictable in terms of um, what they're doing. So I wouldn't, you know, as long as you're really aware of your surroundings while you're driving, it's not too dissimilar from driving in the States in terms of left and right. Got it. Got it. Uh, now, as far as like wildlife, you know, while you were up there, did you see anything uh, out of the ordinary? So, and I think this is probably pretty similar to most of Europe. There's not a ton of large wildlife. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't say that this is something you need to be super concerned about on a trip to the Italian Dolomites. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, did you need any uh, specific shots or any type of vaccines to go there? Uh, we did not. And what about uh, visas? Like, how long was your visa for? We had a typical tourist visa at mm-hmm. the time, so uh, three weeks mm-hmm. or so, um, and, or maybe three months, maybe yeah. three months or so. <laughs> um, I believe that visas to Europe may have changed in the last few months. Okay. Is that right, Gail? Have yeah. you heard about that? I think there's been a lot of changes to many visas in the last few months. Uh, As always, I'd highly recommend checking the visa status um, okay. before going. Um, at the time, there wasn't a special visa between the United States and the Euro zone, mm-hmm. however. Got it. And um, any specific tips that you would offer when, when going to... Just Italy in general uh, as an American or, I don't know, just different changes in culture or is there a tipping culture there that we should be aware of or... There wasn't a huge tipping culture in Italy, but I would recommend um, a small tip, definitely, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, paying attention to the different regions of Italy. It's it's actually quite a diverse country in terms of uh, culture and what people expect, um, especially between the rural areas and the cities. Now, I'm going to do a little what's in your bag. If if you are there doing Via Freda climbing, what is in your pack? What is in your bag? Great question. Uh, so let's start with shoes. Uh, a lot of people, especially Europeans, will climb Via Freda in typical hiking shoes mm-hmm. um, or more mountaineering style shoes. That's definitely an option. Um, I'd recommend um, a 
shoe with a stiffer sole, like a hiking boot that you might have uh, from a typical hike, um, you know, on a trail. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You can also um, bring uh, rock climbing shoes. Those are definitely an option for some of the routes. Um, and if you own those already, then I definitely recommend bringing them along. Um, if you're a beginner, uh, you definitely do not need to go out and buy a brand new pair of rock climbing shoes just to go climb via Freda. There's a bunch of stuff you can do without those. Got it. And uh, would you suggest uh, renting any type of gear if, if you don't have the gear? I would recommend actually purchasing a Via Freda device of your own. Uh -huh. And the reason I do that is because this is a huge, important piece of safety gear um, mm. that you really want to work well. And um, these are these devices. You can look them up online. Uh, Black Diamond makes Via Freda climbing gear that's um, really well regarded. And the reason that you don't want it to be used is because Via Freda climbing gear um, is a use once thing. If you fall once on your gear, then it's no longer useful. Um, and that's because oh. if you fall on your gear, there's a system in place that will help you catch your fall in an extremely safe manner. But once it's been used, then the tension isn't the same anymore. And if you used it again, the gear may not hold your weight. Okay, so you are now on a climb, and let's say you fall once and you use it. Mm -hmm. Do you need to abort your climb at that point? I would highly recommend um, if you fell on your climb to abort that climb or if you um, had the option to uh, use a backup device. Got it. So mm -hmm. you, you might need two two devices? Yeah, two devices or potentially um, a rope or something to be able to uh, belay yourself back down off of the climb to get back to safety. Now, how much is a Via Freda device? A uh, Via Freda climbing device can range from between eighty and one hundred and thirty dollars. Okay, all right. And uh, you will want um, to either rent or purchase a rock climbing harness, and then you can uh, link this device to your harness. Mm -hmm. As far as like linking the device to the harness, is that a pretty easy process? Yeah, you can definitely look up videos on how to do this online. Um, there's a loop on your harness that you uh, basically just loop the device through, and uh -huh. then you're good to go. Great. And then on the other side of the Via Freda device, there are um, clips, and you clip these uh, to the fixed line on the route. And that the fixed line on Via Freda climbing routes is typically a really substantial um, wire or metal um like rope that mm -hmm. so it's really really strong rope that you're clipping yourself to got it so you don't have to be uh too worried there general generally not although i'd always recommend using your own good judgment when seeing something like that you know if you right. see rust or something uh definitely use your own common sense um but typically these things are pretty well maintained over time so you should have no worries cool very cool uh, so, so after spending uh, a day or even multi multiple days doing via Friday climbing, uh, what do you suggest, uh, doing after that? Or if there's like a must see, uh, attraction around there? There's just so much to see, Gail, in yeah. Northern Italy. Um, it, you really have a lot of options. Uh, you are about a day's drive from Venice, Italy. In okay. this region um, and really close as well to Lake Como if you're interested in looking around at lake culture in northern Italy. Um, so those two options that would each take a day. Um, highly recommend both of those. Uh, really cool places. Definitely different. Uh, Venice being a really amazing city with a really cool cultural influence and then the lake region just being absolutely stunning from a natural landscape point of view. Mm-hmm. Now, when would you suggest uh, going up there for this type of an adventure? The best time to go climb uh, Via Freda and the Dolomites is between May and September. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is whether you really want to be there when you're going to have the best chance to uh, get really good weather. Uh, the nice thing about Via Freda climbing um, is that you can climb while you're having, um, you know, rain or something like that mm -hmm. because of the ladders and other features that have been added to the routes, it's possible to, uh, it's definitely possible to do the route when it's a little bit drizzly outside. 
Got it. Cool. I mean, this sounds like a really fun adventure to try. Uh, I'm going to have to look into how to, to make this happen. Yeah, <laughs> I definitely recommend it, um, especially if you are an outdoorsy person looking for something a little bit unique to go experience. Yeah. So what would you say would be the minimum age if, if you were to bring a, a kid or a teenager? I would say that instead of a minimum age, I'd definitely recommend a maturity level. Um, this is potentially a dangerous thing to do. Um, if you fall en route, you could um, be in danger, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, and so you really want to make sure that if you're uh, bringing um, someone less than 18 that you are really trusting of their ability to make their own decisions in that kind of environment. Okay. All right. That's great advice. Great advice. And, uh, anything else you want to tell us about Via Freda climbing or, or that experience or any other equipment that, that you should bring in your bag or. Yeah. Um, so I definitely also recommend, um, if you have a rock climbing helmet, bring it. Mm -hmm. um, definitely always good to bring uh, protective gear. Mm -hmm. And in terms of other things about the experience that I'd like to mention, it's I would just say um, there's always going to be something unexpected that happens on an adventurous trip. And we want to hear about it. Um, in this case, um, we definitely experienced some um, poor weather, like I mentioned earlier, with the, right, the whiteout, the whiteout and the thunderstorms um, that we experienced. And I would just, you know, mention that these types of things, they always there. There's always the potential for something like that on an adventurous trip. So really being prepared to. Um, change your plan, climb a little bit earlier in the day or be flexible. However, that, you know, the, however that comes to your particular adventure, um, really just helps it be as successful as possible. Great. Great, man. This is, this is fantastic. You learn something new every day. That's true. True. So Shannon is actually going to be partaking in an upcoming adventure, which this will be an episode, maybe late in the, the summer or fall. Uh, tell me about your upcoming adventure you're going to do this summer. This summer, uh, my partner Graham Zimmerman and I are planning a pack rafting adventure to um, remote Alaska. So pack, pack rafting. Yep, that's it. So explain pack rafting. A uh, pack raft is really similar to uh, an inflatable raft that you might raft uh, a river in, uh -huh. except instead of it being a big raft that you could get six people in, it's a single person that you can fit in the raft. And the reason it's called a pack raft is because the raft itself packs down to a size where you could fit it into a backpacking backpack. What about your oars? Uh, the oars are you can get you can get oars that are either collapsible or you strap it to the outside of your bag. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the reason that you would do this is so that you can hike in somewhere and then raft out of it, you know, get in there, wow. blow up your raft and wrap it, you know, come out. So have you ever been to to this area? Like, have you ever done this river? Uh, so where we're going is uh, it's called Antioch Chak National Monument in um, it's on the Aleutian chain in Alaska. And uh, inside this national monument, there's a volcano Whoa. and inside the volcano, there's a lake. Whoa, wait, hold on. Inside the volcano is a lake. Yeah. So uh, the volcano at some point erupted and inside now there exists a lake. So kind of like Crater Lake in Oregon? Uh, similar to Crater Lake in Oregon, uh, quite a bit smaller, I okay. would say, in terms of the size of the lake. Um, so our plan is to hike into this lake and then uh, raft from the lake to the other shore um, in the Gulf of Alaska on the Aleutian chain. Whoa. So so how do you get out of the lake into like where you can raft? Yeah, so the lake... Um, the water exits the lake via a river. So the river will take us from 
this lake inside this volcano to the ocean. So are you going to be like on class five, class four, class three? Uh, according to the research we've done so far, there's a little bit of class four rapid, but it's easily um, walk. I, you can hike around if you want. So we're, our plan is to uh, review what it's looking like when we get there and make some really safe decisions on what to do. Ah, that sounds like a great plan. <laughs> And uh, can we talk about uh, why you're doing this trip or what you're doing this for? Yeah, so uh, I would say not quite yet. Okay, yeah. okay, all right. Um, but I would say the main reason that we're doing it is because we love to try new things. And yeah. um, I'm particularly really inspired by human-powered adventure and really being able to uh, get from point A to point B without the use of fossil fuels. And this is uh, one of the, you know, modes of transportation we're exploring for being able to do that. Wow. Okay, so stay tuned for a pack rafting uh, adventure episode with Shannon uh, later on this year. Thanks so much, Gail. Thank you.